I think the topic is very interesting, uh, interesting and I'm uh, really pleased to have a chance to tell you about our view at Acadie's Power and my view uh, about what the future looks like. Uh, my view is uh, very powertrain centric, so if we're going to have different vehicles that go more miles, uh, we're going to be more focused on the fuel efficiency of those vehicles. And if they're going to go more uh, miles and we still have vehicles, we're going to still worry about uh, doing that with low emissions. And we're going to worry about the cost of those vehicles. So I think one of the very important ingredients that I'll touch on in, in this discussion is uh, not just what's a disruption, but which disruptions are distractions and which disruptions are going to become de rigueur. Right? That's really what we're trying to figure out. Which ones are the distractions and which ones become the real future? So if I do this correctly, I point and push. And let's go to the next slide. Because I'm not getting it. Check the battery. It's always a problem with the batteries, usually. OK, here we are. <laughs> Never the powertrain, <laughs> unless you cheat. So um, some of you might be familiar with this car, uh, this uh, book from uh, Professor Sperling, UC Davis. He wrote it a few years ago. I thought it was uh, quite fascinating in terms of how he laid things out. But I've kind of got uh, boiled it down to three points. Uh, first one is that he said, hey, the number of vehicles in the world is going to double. And I think when you think about the industry, you know, we just talked really about the wealthiest market in the world, the United States, where we have fairly wealthy buyers. We can buy a lot of vehicles. Prestige and performance matters. Uh, but just a few weeks ago, I was in India. It's a different market. And actually, the growth that we're seeing that takes us to $2 billion is primarily in markets like India and China, as you well know. So number of vehicles double? Yeah, that's uh, probably going to happen. Uh, next one, need for sharply reduced fuel consumption, or fu reduced fuel consumption. Yeah. Very, very important, of course. Uh, I don't know when peak oil was or will be, but I think it's pretty easy to understand that the Earth is not producing oil, and so eventually it will be gone, my generation, your gener next generation, sometime in the future. So yeah, I agree with uh, Professor Sperling. That was the wrong button. Thank you. Someone's helping me. OK. Last one was internal combustion engines are at their limit. This is the one that is wrong. It's just uh, fundamentally wrong. I think you've seen it already with conventional engines in the marketplace getting much more efficient. And uh, I have a chart that I like to look at that looks at fuel efficiency on an, on an engineering metric over time, over decades. And they've been getting consistently better for years and years. We've got lots more to do, and I'll tell you about one today. But before we leave that, uh, to me, the difference between things that are uh, disruptions that become, that are simply distractions, and those that become de rigueur, uh, is really in the economics. Um, Department of Energy, so I'm going to give you a few quotes of some pieces of information that aren't me. Department of Energy said, hey, we're going to have IC engines for a long time. And again, if we're going to have IC engines for a long time, we need to be very, very much more efficient. Of course, some people uh, don't see that. They think everybody sees it, it's all going to have a plug. Uh, my perspective is we've got a problem with a battery, but I'm not the only one. If you talk to the head of Toyota's research department, you might be familiar with this quote from uh, a year ago or so, a little bit more than a year ago. Basically, we need a new battery. We need a new battery because, not because the batteries we have don't work. They work very well. You can drive a Tesla, it works just fine. A Leaf just works fine. Toyota Hybrid works just fine. The problem is they cost too much. They take up too much space in the vehicle. And if you're going to put nine or ten vehicle ten people in your transportation, in your autonomous vehicle or whatever, then the loads get heavier. You need more batteries. Right? So uh, the heaviest vehicles are the least likely to be battery powered. And uh, so maybe some of these individual transporters, like the Segway, maybe this is OK for better transport, but uh, for larger vehicles, not going to work. Um, and the other problem we have, and I think uh, CEO of Ford, Mark Fields, pointed us quite well with this quote, is that we really need a market acceptance of these vehicles. We as an industry have been working. I think Toyota probably started in the early 80s, mid 80s, to develop the Prius. We brought it to the market in 1997 in Japan and 2000 here. We've been at this for a very long time. And of course, Thomas Edison had one back and Henry Ford's Model T back in 1913. So it's not a new idea, but it's the economics that really kills it. And, and the consumers aren't buying them because they're too expensive. And you might say, we'll get over that in America because we're wealthy and we're rich and we have a lot of uh, capital that we can spend. And so you know, they're going to start in California and move across. So every CEO in California is going to have a Tesla and then eventually all of us will. Uh, but if you go to India, you realize this is not going to work. And the government, our government, can't continue to give out $7,500. Or in California, you get the federal $7,500 plus the state $5,000. You get all these incentives. We can't incentivize our way to scale. So the 100 million engines and vehicles made around the world today, 
to make the two billion in the future, maybe we're gonna make 200 million, unless Brian's right, uh, then it's back to 100 million. You just can't incentivize 100 million units of sales. So uh, we've done a lot of studies, there's tons, of course. Uh, this is, uh, I would say, one of the more recent ones from the National Research Council, studying what technologies are there to improve vehicle fuel efficiencies. They looked at vehicle uh, technologies as well as engine technologies. These two charts, which are impossible for you to read, basically show that the more you want, the more it costs you. Right? The cost is going up in the vertical accent and the efficiency improvements are going uh, to, the, to the right as you look at them. Uh, so everything costs more, and this is kind of the fundamental barrier to electric vehicles, pure electric vehicles, fundamental vi uh, barrier to hybrid fu uh, fuel cell vehicles, kind of all these technologies that are available and that we see, you know, if they were free, they'd already be in, right? So uh, everything costs more. Uh, interestingly, uh, for the first time, the government recognized Decatur's power and said, hey, we might not look at this technology. It offers 30% better fuel efficiency, but you know, it's not in the market yet, so we really can't talk a lot about it. So that was kind of, but we were happy to be captured in the study the first time. Uh, this book came out also in 2009, same time as Professor Sperling's book, and said, hey, there's this kind of crazy, wacky engine from history called the opposed piston engine. And these engines are simple, they're compact, they're fuel efficient, they have the potential for very low emissions, they cost less and they weigh less. So really, what don't they do great? And why don't we have them around? And basically, I'll tell you the answer to that question. Uh, for a long time, we didn't care about fuel efficiencies. 1950, 1960, didn't really care. Fuel was cheap, no one cared. Uh, the other thing was, these engines are really difficult to engineer. And so the team I have at Acades Power in California, we've been working for 12 years to figure out how to make them work. And work means do all the things that engines need to do modernly today. Meet emissions, be fuel efficient, be durable, reliable, quiet, be manufacturable, all those things. And uh, they're really hard to make work, uh, but we've done it. So we've been at this now for 12 years. The company was founded in 2004. We've invested more than $125 million uh, to do that. I would note $125 million sometimes sounds like a lot of money, but it's a tenth of what Fisker got to fail. So it's not so bad. Um, our engines have been demonstrated now. We've run our engine, our test cell, uh, for 10 years, since 2005, so coming up on 11th year. Uh, we have demonstrated they're more efficient than conventional engines by a lot. All of my colleagues at Ford and GM and Toyota around the world are working on trying to find one or half a percent improvement in fuel efficiency. We've demonstrated a 20% advantage on diesel versus a diesel-powered conventional engine, and uh, more than 60% more efficient than spark-ignited gasoline engines. So really, fundamentally better engines by a wide, wide margin. That's our engine there in the test cell. Uh, again, been running for a long time. Happens to be a truck-like engine, but car engines are coming too. So I could spend many, many hours many days discussing the technology, uh, but I'm going to leave that for here in the interest of time and just tell you that we have the data that show it works, so I don't really worry about explaining the technology anyway because I can just show you the data. And uh, we've published a lot of that data. I'll come to that maybe in a moment here. The key ingredient, though, is that this engine, from a fundamental standpoint, delivers this fuel efficiency, delivers the emissions, is lower cost and weight, whereas the other technologies, and so this is a truck uh, publication for National Research Council. It's the one that the uh, Obama administration used to put the Greenhouse Gas 1 regulations in place, and there's an update to this coming that will be the Greenhouse Gas 2 regulation. But nonetheless, fundamentally, you know, you need to improve fuel efficiency, and it's possible to do it, but their conclusion was, hey, you're going to spend $23,000 per vehicle to achieve that kind of efficiency improvement. So we do that kind of efficiency improvement for no cost increase whatsoever. Probably a cost reduction. So this engine up in the top right-hand corner um, runs in our dyno all the time. I actually have two dynos and building a third because we've got so much work to do. Uh, we've measured it at 40%, 44% best point brake thermal efficiency and an average brake thermal efficiency around 42%. And we benchmarked this versus a like engine like the Ford Power Stroke, GM Duramax, Cummins ISB, which is the engine that's in the Dodge Ram pickup trucks, the bigger engine, uh, and they're heavy-duty trucks. And it is about measured in our labs versus measured their published data 20% more efficient, and we're not done. We have a roadmap that takes it to 32% more efficient. Uh, and we've covered all the other gamuts. So, so you know, on, our engine happens to be a two-stroke, so oil consumption is a fundamental issue of two-stroke engines. We've solved that, we have very low oil consumption. Of course, you have to meet emissions, we all know that. Some people are learning it painfully. Durability, gotta have it, gotta fit an existing vehicle, so we're not re-architecting re -architecting the vehicle to make the engine fit. And so we think that makes it fundamentally uh, compatible with what's already here. We don't need to do new fueling infrastructure. 
We don't need vehicles. We don't need manufacturing plants. Basically, these engines can be made in the same plants that make engines today, whether it's Romeo or Romulus, or Trenton or whichever one you want, Cleveland. 